So um, Hope-based communications is sort of a new journey that I just started. In um, July, I uh, left my role at Amnesty International as head of brand um, to become an independent consultant um, because I just, I'm oh, hearing some feedback, so maybe just make sure everyone is muted who's not talking. Um, when I turn off my camera, can you see my screen now? So you should see hope based communications. Maybe, Derek, if you want to unmute it, let me know you can see the presentation. So, um, so I, I've been working in, for the last 15 years in communications in government, in business, and for NGOs, as rich as possible. Um, and, but in the last few years, um, something changed that the facts weren't enough anymore. Just getting the story out there wasn't enough. And I'm not going to go into too much of the details why. Uh, and I'm going to sort of refer vaguely to the opposition. And I think most people will get a clear sense of, of what I mean by that. But basically, core values like openness, human rights, rule of law, just citing those values wasn't enough to win political debates anymore. Um, and so there's sort of a key starting point for hope based communications is that we need to public opinion isn't something that's constantly moving in our direction. It's something that every day we have to work to keep it going in the right direction. And that basically passing laws is not enough. So there's a quote from George Orwell, like right after World War II, he says that the freedom we enjoy depends on public opinion. Um, law is no protection. You can make laws, but whether or not they're carried out depends on public opinion. Um, and so, what we're seeing right now is actually public opinion starting to shift away from the laws and norms that we thought we'd established. Um, and what that challenge essentially we saw with, with populism was narratives that basically we see our opponents saying things that really shock and outrage us and our instinctive approach is to call it out and say, oh, did you see what they said? But what we were inadvertently doing was strengthening it by speaking only about the issues that they wanted on the table. Essentially, we've, as civil society, are so reactive, and I will come back to that later, that I think we kind of forgot a little bit about how to talk about the things we stand for. Um, and so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the narrative and framing stuff that I saw that sort of made me rethink the way I do communications. Um, but essentially, when I started looking, re-examining is my communication actually talking about what I stand for or am I just reacting to an opponent? Um, that's when I realized, actually, I'm not that good at articulating what it is that I stand for, particularly not in a way that actually makes sense to ordinary people. That words like human rights, I sort of take for granted what they mean and use them in passing, but I'm not actually really clear what is what do those words actually mean to my audience. And so, I basically came up with this, uh, this, I started sort of changing my own communication and I realized these are shifts anyone can make. And so I developed these five shifts that I can apply to any piece of work, not just written work or visual communication, but actually also strategy. And so I'm going to take you through these five shifts now. Uh, the most basic principle was a shift from fear to hope. So I realized that the sort of basic approach to go to position of activism, of activists, of civil society, tends to be to try and stir anger, to make people outraged. Look at these horrible things that are happening. We need to do something about it. Um, but what we didn't realize here is that actually showing people how bad things are without showing them solution, we felt thought that that was necessary because otherwise people would say, sort of be lazy or take for granted the freedom they have, and we have to shock people out of that but actually we're creating despondency. It's a despondency trap. Um, there's some academic research on this that shows 
you know, if people think things are getting worse, they're actually less likely to get involved because they just accept uh, the bad situation as a new norm. What's actually more important is to give people hope that things can get better. And so a key thing to note is that hope is not about happiness or positivity, everything's great. It's about the belief that things can be better in the future than they are today. Um, and so what our approach has been a lot more to, to focus on everything that's going wrong. We're sort of, it's almost written into our DNA to focus on the worst things in the world. But then it suddenly realizes we have a group of leaders around the world now who thrive on people's fear and the sense that things are out of control, um, that people feel they have less control over the future. I mean, mass, massive factor that we've already talked about is it's a result of economic crisis. And migration has proved a great scapegoat for that. But what we have to ask ourselves is, if these leaders thrive on conflict, crisis, and on controversy, if our response to them is to increase those three factors, to say how disgraceful they are, to say how much we're against them, to say how bad things are going, are we inadvertently creating the environment in which they thrive? Um, and one thing we can come back to, this also applies to climate change, for example, and actually does telling people that it's a crisis make people actually less likely to act. Um, but for now, I really want one key challenge also for the sort of name and shame approach to human rights and other civil society work, first of all, is we have a group of politicians. Not only are they shameless, so there's no shaming these politicians, they actually thrive on it. So there's um, a research in the United States, um, if people are interested, I'll share the podcast around later, who's saying basically our principle has long been that sunlight is disinfectant. When you expose something, bring it to light, you cure it. But actually, she says, well, sunlight also makes things grow. And so what we've inadvertently been doing is shining a light on the extreme far right politicians who say these horrible things. And we say this is so terrible. That they said it. We're actually giving them the publicity they need to grow, to thrive. And then the politicians who actually do the right thing are boring and get ignored and get no publicity at all. Um, another key factor is confirmation bias. So we will go to the supporters of populists and tell them that the things they're fearing are wrong. They, they're wrong to be afraid. They're wrong to be racist. They're wrong to think what they think. Um, but research shows that if you just tell someone they're wrong with facts, not only will you not change their mind, you will actually reinforce them in that position. Um, and so we actually need to find a different way to a share our ideas with people, but above all, um, if we want people to have empathy with those we're trying to help, um, we can't reach them on that, that level of fear. And so I'm going to briefly speak to some of the neuroscience behind this thinking. Um, and it's, I'm going to oversimplify it a little bit for the sake of time, uh, but there's plenty more if anyone's interested on this. But so the very basic principle that I found very uh, important was in the very, in the bottom part of this screen, you see the lower, uh, we call it the downstairs brain or the lower part of the brain. And this is where your survival instincts are. So the sort of going back to primordial man, your fight or flight instincts. Um, whenever your brain uh, encounters any kind of stimulus whatsoever, whether it's a message, some, whether something's saying something, whether it's someone sending you an aggressive email or someone's rude on the street and not getting out of your way, your brain is interpreting everything it sees to figure out is this a threat or not. And when your brain sees a threat, it's triggering the amygdala. And that's the part of the brain that releases stress hormones, your worry, your anxiety. Um, this is defensiveness. And this is important for us because those um, hormones, those instincts block rational thought. That's where instinct comes in. And the empathy we want people to feel for each other and for the people we want to help, say the people who are poor, the people who are refugees, um, that resides in a different part of the brain, in the upper part of the brain in the frontal cortex. So brain scanning has shown that when people feel those positive emotions, those are the parts of the brain that are warming up. And so when we come to people with messages of crisis and urgency, we may actually be shutting down the emotions we need people to feel. And actually by triggering fear, we're pushing them into the arms of exactly the people we're trying to oppose. And by contrast, um, 
empathy and those rational thought, those positive emotions that live in the up part of the brain are triggered by a feeling of confidence, of joy, uh, also humor, ironically. And obviously this is a massive challenge for us. How do we deal with some of the most horrible things happening in our society today? But we also need to trigger these positive emotions to get the reactions we need from people. So that's where um, hope-based communication tries to come in and help us with that. But to summarize the neuroscience, there's this great quote by the writer Zadie Smith, which isn't speaking of neuroscience, but it's a wonderful metaphor. I'm going to talk a lot about metaphors today for how this works, which essentially she says, citizens have within them the full range of behavioral possibilities. So we all operate based on the experiences, the values, the identity, how we see people around us uh, operating. And these things change. There's research, for example, that shows um, you can, even if you are anti-racist, you believe that you in, in full equality, if a leader of your in-group, even if you don't agree with them or like them, displays racist tendencies and says racist things, it might be encouraging racism on your part at a subconscious level, even if you don't want it to. So what Zadie Smith says is these behaviors depend on the who's conducting the orchestra. Uh, and so right now, the current leaders have the most banal militaristic melodies in mind. Those of us who remember finding music must now try to play it. So to go back to the picture of the brain, essentially, what the, the lesson to take away on a communications point from this is we can't fight fear with fear. So when Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high, she was actually making a very important point about neuroscience, that we cannot fight um, populism and divisive messages with divisive messages of our own. We have to play a finer music based on the things we stand for. Uh, so, for example, one of the reasons this is important is this is just a very one random survey, but it's in which people, um, this is a survey of liberal minded people in Europe. And they, they basically can share, can simultaneously hold two seemingly contradictory ideas. One that refugees are willing to work hard and fit in, another that refugees are looking for handouts. And so the important thing to know is people can have different ideas, different ways of seeing the world can coexist in people's mind. The point is which one gets triggered the most. And so again, thinking of the brain, these ideas are essentially neurons in the brain that get spark up once they're activated. The basic lesson here may really simplify is rather than attacking the ideas of your opponent, when you attack them, you're repeating them and then you're activating them in the minds of your audience. And what you're not doing is talking about your own ideas. So the key point is, again, when they go low, resist the temptation to attack them and say how terrible their ideas are. We have to talk about our own ideas and strengthen those. Um, so I'm going to show um, in, uh, one example of a campaign from the 80s. So this is going to speak to um, this challenge. What do you do when you're dealing with, say, a situation of horrible suffering? Um, and you need, how do you do a positive message when you're dealing with very negative things happening in the world? So um, I'm going to show you a video that was run in Chile in 1988, when the dictator Augusto Pinochet, um, I'm going to get rid of through the ad. So Augusto Pinochet was forced by the international community to run a referendum on whether or not he should stay in power. And the few remaining survivors of the opposition wanted to run an ad that the typical human rights ad about the disappearances, the torture, uh, the, the terrible human rights violations of Augusto Pinochet, a very dark video. But instead, they had an ad expert, and this was made into a movie called No, because if you're you voting yes to Pinochet or no to Pinochet, uh, no is a lot obviously more negative. And obviously, we in civil society love saying no to things. So this is a video, it's from the 1980s, so you need to sort of bear that in mind, have a little pinch of salt. And it's called, uh, you, you don't need to understand Spanish to get the key sense of the video, but it's called Chile, Happiness is Coming. And so what this video did was it took Chileans who didn't basically, they didn't even believe that this was going to be a real vote. Um, and so the challenge was, how do we give Chileans something to take a risk and go out and vote for something other than finishing? 
So this video is called Surely Happiness is Coming. And you'll hear a key line in the middle of the video where they say, without dictatorship, happiness will come. Um, I'm, if you don't hear the sound, just say something in the chat. So there's only so much 1980s we can take, so I'm going to skip it just ahead to the end. Um, so in 1988, you're going to hear uh, sort of the, out of the jingle that was being sung on the streets by tens of thousands of people. So it's obviously, you know, there's, there's a lot to laugh at in this ad, but this ad did several things. Um, and I'd obviously love to hear yourselves at the end, but, you know, one of the, the, the most important thing it did was of what freedom looked like. This is people who'd lived under a dark dictatorship for more than a decade. They, but it gave them something else to go and vote for. But there's a lot of other s subtle psychological things. There's large groups of people, so this is about community. You see people hugging, so it's about empathy, it's about community. Also, you see that everyone is smiling, and we mirror the emotions of the people we see. So this is also designed to make people feel good. Um, and while some of the production values are a little dated, I'm going to show you some other videos that are more modern versions of this. Um, but contrast that with the sort of imagery that we see today. So I won't dwell on this because we all know what's happening in this picture. This is a far-right politician uh, trying to scare people with racist images. But then look at the imagery that we as civil society use. Essentially, civil society and the far right had the same message. This is an unprecedented crisis. You, it's very hard to find anything written about refugees uh, from an NGO that doesn't say this is the most serious crisis since the Second World War. Uh, I, I myself wrote a lot of content around the rise of populism, calling to mind the 30s. Um, the problem is we, when you talk about um, flooding and rising levels uh, and flows, when you start to talk about people as if they're rising water, what do you do when water is rising? You build a wall. So the far right and civil society had the same message. There is a crisis. Our solution was safe and legal routes. Their solution was build a wall. And so the key point of hope based communications, what this is trying to fix is we need to get better at talking about the things we want to happen. Um, so here's one example. Australian NGOs were among the first to realize things are going wrong because they've had a terrible government for more than a decade. And they brought in some of the top framing and communications experts from the United States. And they realized, you know what we need to start doing is saying what we want. And what we want is to bring refugees here. And I think in Europe for a long time, we were afraid to say that we, because that would be a pull factor, right? And so instead we focused on the push factor. Look at the horrible things that are happening that, that we have to help these people because these terrible things that are happening to them. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that a little later. Uh, and I myself thought, okay, surely with the horrors of Syria being on our TV screens, people are going to put tents up in the street and take as many people as we need to. But we were, I think, afraid to say some of the things we wanted to happen because we were afraid they were unpopular. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are available to us to communicate more as effectively as the populists do. But to me, understanding our audiences better should only come after we're really clear on what it is we want to ask them for. What is the message we want to send them? 
what are the things we stand for? And so we can, if we do, if you do audience research today, you might come away with the idea, oh, people are against migration because people will ask questions like, do you think migrants could be terrorists? If we have a sense of how are we going to get support for this message, bring them here, that's, then we can start looking at, well, what is the way to pre present this message to people in a way that will trigger their values um, and win their support? Essentially, what we're looking at is how do we shift what is considered common sense? So there's this idea called the Overton window. So this is an idea that you can have an idea that's completely unthinkable or radical, but through repetition, if done skillfully, it starts to become more familiar to people so that it becomes acceptable or sensible. And eventually, once it's repeated in the mainstream so much, it eventually becomes popular policy. So just before the summer, we saw the Denmark's Social Democrats win election on an anti-migrant platform, for example. Essentially, what happened in Europe and elsewhere was you have leaders who were saying things that were unthinkable and radical, and civil society would respond and say, isn't it terrible that they're saying these things? We were essentially helping them um, talk, get their issues into the mainstream of public opinion. So at first, they were you know, laughed at and you know, sort of scorned. But through repetition, they've shifted what is considered mainstream opinion. On the one hand, that's deeply depressing. But what we can also take away from it is the things we believe in. If you believe in an open world, a world of tolerance, of empathy, where we take care of each other, um, where community is more important than profit, where people are able to move as they want, those a world, say, built on sustainable energy, a lot of those things feel unthinkable right now that maybe uh, our institutions, our organizations, our politicians will be laughed at if they say it in public. If we actually find a way to make the case for these ideas, then we can shift them to the point where they become a little bit acceptable and sensible and eventually will become policy. Uh, that to me is what Hope Based Communications is all about. And if you want any better example than that, look at the Green New Deal which is getting attacked like crazy in the United States, but the European Commission president just put it at the center of her policy agenda. So what we're saying here is that messaging is not about just understanding what people want at this very moment and just saying it to them. It's about making popular what needs to be said. Um, essentially, the sort of message that I go around with Hope Based Communications is, we all know this speech, I have a policy recommendation by um, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King wasn't actually planning to give the I Have a Dream um, peroration in his speech in the March on Washington. It had been a really hot day uh, and dozens of speakers had gone before Dr. King. And so he was actually losing the crowd and he stopped to wipe his brow. And in the bottom right hand corner of this picture, you see Mahalia Jackson with the big flower lapel looking up at him. And she shouted up at him, Martin, tell them about the dream. And then he gave the speech and so the sort of key underlying message behind Hope Based Communications is we need to tell them about the dream. And the challenge is not acting like, you know, it's, when I say dream, it's not that you're a dreamer, it's how do we make that dream a reality? Because if we don't talk about the world we want to achieve, who will? And until you start talking about your dream, it has no chance of becoming a reality. And remember the words of his speech were a very clear picture. It was, I have a dream that down in Alabama, with its vicious racism, one day little white boys and little white girls will walk down the street holding hands with little black boys and little black girls. So put a very, very clear picture of that world he wanted to see. And so I'm going to show you a modern version both of that speech and this chili ad. And so with this ad comes a real challenge. So um, this was Nike by supporting Colin Kaepernick, the American footballer who took a knee. Uh, to protest police violence and was essentially kicked out of the National Football League as a result. So Nike took a political stand by supporting Colin Kaepernick. But what Nike have been doing through their advertising, not only, you know, we, we may be cynical and say they're just trying to sell shoes, but they not only have they taken very strong positions and defended certain values in their advertising, they are they are defeating and undermining stereotypes, not by talking about them, but replacing them with completely different images and ways of seeing the world. And so what I'll talk about that in a moment is whole based communications is really built on don't attack the things we want to see, replace them with different ideas.
If people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you think you can do, good. Stay that way. Because what non believers fail to understand is that calling a dream crazy is not an insult, it's a compliment. Don't try to be the fastest runner in your school or the fastest in the world. Be the fastest ever. Don't picture yourself wearing OBJ's jersey. Picture OBJ wearing yours. Don't settle for homecoming queen or linebacker. Do both. Lose 120 pounds and become an Ironman after beating a brain tumor. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. If you're born a refugee, don't let it stop you from playing soccer for the national team at age 16. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. When they talk about the greatest team in the history of the sport, make sure it's your team. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football, play at the highest level. And if you're a girl from Compton, don't just become a tennis player. Become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. <laughs> So that's another way to lots of really inspiring sports people. So, okay, what does that do with civil society? I'll show you in that a little bit later that that speaks to that. But essentially what that is doing is talking about the things we're for rather than the things we're against. It's showing how things can be. And what we often do in civil society is call out the behavior we're against, um, but we rarely celebrate the behavior we're for. So this is um, a statue that's in the, in the reception of Amnesty International's office. And it speaks to something I see a lot that we often speak about uh, justice, but the images we show are almost always of injustice. And so the challenge is how do we show people what justice looks like? Hands holding the bars are the things we're against. In this image, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is food, or some, some clever people say wood. If you're from Ireland, this is a symbol of punishment because to get the wooden spoon is what the, the mother or the grandmother in the kitchen will take out the wooden spoon out of the drawer and give um, a smack or hit the child with it when they're bold. This is an example of framing so that the way we interpret the words we see depends on uh, the pre-associations we have, our lived experience, the ideas we already have. And so, I'm doing a very, very fast introduction to framing, but the, the point here is we can use words thinking that they're neutral. We can release factual legal language thinking it won't, um, it's just the fact. So it's clean communication. But actually, you can never know for sure how your communication will be interpreted by the people receiving it because their own lived experience will interpret the words you use. And we use metaphor inadvertently even, even when we think we're using very formal scientific language. So we may talk, for example, about managing refugee flows, but flows, again, calls to mind rising water as a natural disaster. Um, um, so there's more reading on this from these two writers are the sort of leading progressive communicators, and the, the title of the book speaks for itself. But the, the two key things that they warn us of, when we spend all our time um, repeating the messages of the other side, but negating them, we are actually reinforcing those ideas in the mind of our audience. But worse still, we are accepting the systems that are insinuated with the language used by our opponents. So George Lakoff talks about worldviews. He talks about um, on the conservative side, you have people who are strict parents. They believe that if you give people handouts, or you help people too much, they'll, they'll get soft. So if the baby in the crib is crying, you need to let it cry because it needs to learn to take care of itself. Whereas a progressive nurturing parent has the desire to help people. And so Lakoff says that the conservative worldview is built on fear. The idea that we all have to take care of ourselves because we live in this dangerous world, that humans are basically individuals. And 
neoliberalism and capitalism is basically built on this idea that taking care of yourself is the natural thing to do. It's actually the best way to ensure good society because if everyone takes care of themselves, there will be balance. Um, whereas in the progressive worldview is built on empathy and a responsibility to care for each other. And actually Yuval Hariri has written a lot lately on actual human nature is actually operating in groups and taking care of each other. Uh, that you know, sort of early human beings uh, were operated in groups where a child would be taken care of by several people within the group and that the human race wouldn't have gotten where we did if we didn't take care of each other. These basic underlying ideas not only um, drive political opinion, they are triggered by the different words we use when we talk about different issues. So for example, if we want to have a minimum wage, the other side might say, oh, that's bad for the economy and it might make people soft and dependent. And so policies that we push might actually be blocked because of subconscious ideas that we have inadvertently triggered or the other side has triggered. And so what we need to do is understand how people think of the way the world works. And that's something where focus groups come in very helpful. So for example, one piece of research in the UK identified that people think of the, uh, the economy as a bucket full of money. And if you take money out of the bucket to say, build homes for refugees, or uh, provide more education, free education, there's less money in the bucket for you. Uh, the economy doesn't actually work that way, but these simple ideas, people draw on basic everyday metaphors, physical metaphors to understand complex systems. And so we focus very much on our day-to-day -day issues on what's going wrong with the world, but we don't often think of how do we actually replace the way of thinking in, in the minds of our audience? So this piece of research, this is just to give you an example of how to try and find more appropriate metaphors. And they tried to shift away from this idea of the economy as a bucket to say the economy is like a computer program. The, it's currently programmed to work one way, but we can reprogram it to work a different way. Um, and we're gonna come back to that. That's something we could potentially apply to civil society and to human rights. But the basic point here is you can be against austerity, you could be anti-capitalist, but what are you for? What are you trying to build? You can do as much as you like to prove that austerity isn't working, but until you've actually made the case for what you want governments to do instead, which is public spending, you're not going to change the system. So we have to make the case for the things we want to see in the world. Um, and usually what we do in our messaging is we tend to say that things are not crimes so this particularly in civil society, where we we say um, we see journalists being locked up, our message is journalism is not a crime. We say abortion is not a crime, that we don't want governments to criminalize women for getting abortions. Um, we say we try we we spend a lot of time lately highlighting attacks and killings of human rights defenders. So we say defending human rights is not a crime. So we, the government shouldn't be treating human rights defenders like criminals. The problem with all of these phrases is what you fight, you feed. So the word not is weak in the sentence. And essentially, there are two concepts on the screen right now, migration and crime. And so given that we use this slogan over and over again, it's not a surprise that surveys show people, when people are asked to explain human rights, they see it as something that's there to protect criminals. We're basically, if you're thinking of the brain again, the concept of migration and the concept of criminality are both being triggered in this sentence and ideas that fire neurons that fire together in the brain fuse. So they start to become fused together, the concepts of criminality and migration. Above all, what we're not doing here is saying, what is journalism? What is migration? What is getting an abortion? What is being a human rights defender? So we're not actually making the case for the things we believe. We're just, again, repeating the message of our opponent. Um, so this is also replicated visually. So this is an example of Amnesty International campaigning for the release of one of its staff members in Turkey. And we are literally carrying out that slogan. So Turkey has put one of our staff members in jail. Here's an activist in a cage. So we're bringing to life essentially the actions of our opponent, but we're also bringing to life their message. So. This is something you can also see with people who are seeking asylum or people who are trying to move to another country. Donald Trump says that they are animals. 
and so he puts them in a cage. What do you usually see in a cage? You usually see animals in a cage. So he is dehumanizing them. What we have to ask ourselves is if we replicate these images for people without showing an alternative, if people only see images of people who are migrating, people from say Latin America in cages, are we actually helping, supporting, without wishing to, that dehumanization? Um, it's when you actually then start to try and make this shift from talk, shifting away from what we're against to what we're for, you start, start asking yourself some difficult questions. So in civil society's work on the death penalty, for example, we always tend to use the image of a noose. Um, when I was talking about the brain, one, one other interesting piece of research is that if you remind people of their mortality, so the more you remind people of their fact that they too can die one day, the more conservative they become in their policy choices. And so what are you doing when you show people a picture of a noose? So these were posters shown in Sri Lanka, which didn't actually have the death penalty. Uh, the message underneath was the first precept of Buddhism is to respect life. So again, it's the kind of contradictory sort of cynical messaging um, typical of the NGO world where we're saying the government is being hypocritical but what and we're trying to sort of confuse the audience but get their attention because there's this dissonance here um, but actually what we're doing is just making a foreign symbol more familiar to people and also reminding them of their mortality so the question here is if we are against the death penalty if we want a world without the death penalty what are we for uh, and if you take this logic to its conclusion, we're actually for a world where no matter how heinous the crime you've committed, you deserve a second chance. That we rehabilitate all people, no matter what they've done, um, and that is what society should do. That's pretty. That's a pretty hard message to go out to the public with, right? How would we do something like that? Well, here's an example. So in Florida, this is not on the death penalty, but there was a campaign recently in Florida to get felons, to get people who've been in jail, the right to vote. And so instead of, they didn't tell the stories of here are felons who've had the vote taken away. Their message was, we believe in second chances. And they would tell stories from daily life and they would show ordinary Floridians who believe in second chances. So this is what we're trying to achieve with hope-based communications is find a different angle to make the case for the underlying way of thinking, the underlying values that will build support. Because as long as, you know, we may be afraid that there are ideas about the death penalty that will block people. But research shows that actually, for example, another way to uh, defeat the death penalty is to focus on innocent people who are being executed. Obviously, we're afraid that, say, for example, arguments like refugees could be terrorists will always be a block to winning support. So we have to defeat that argument. So we go and argue against it. That's actually just putting that issue top of mind. What we need to do is think, what is the basic fundamental argument we want to make and focus on that story and activating that in the minds of our audience and not activating the ideas that block us. So in um, Russia, for example, I was work, did a workshop um, doing just this with some civil society activists recently. And what came up time and time again was the police. And you know, when we were trying to work in the workshop on like, what is the world we want to see, we talked about the police being kinder, being better, and it was quite hard for activists to do that because, well, first of all, are we going to give them credit? Are we going to help them whitewash? Um, and, you know, actually just a few days after the workshop, then there were some very violent scenes where the you know, police were even just detaining and beating up people going for a run. There's two things here. One is trying to, I'll, I'll show you a potential way we can start doing this, but also what is common in the messaging of civil society, we've done some social listening where we looked at what is um, all conversations on social media that use the words civil society have a narrative of civil society against government. And while we often do oppose government, we also actually need governments to behave in a certain way to achieve our goals. We don't believe like the populists do in having zero government. We believe in a kind, caring government with a responsibility to care for people. And so what happens if our imagery is always of a state that bullies, of activists on the street fighting police, and there's uh, violence on both sides in the minds of the audience, to quote a certain politician. But if all you see is the state as the strict parent, 
as the authority wielding violence to maintain order. Um, speaking like from the perspective of a middle of the road audience. What about the state we want to see? The doctors, the nurses, the teachers, the educators. So the danger is when we focus on the state doing all the things we don't want it to do, that becomes reality. That becomes all people expect. So thinking back to Chile in 1988, how do we give people that alternative possibility of how things should be? And there's been some a few cases. I actually heard an Azerbaijani journalist telling me about how a story went viral for them about police in Georgia giving out ice cream. And people were all saying, well, if the police in Georgia do that, why all our all ours do is ask us for bribes or beat us up. Why can't our police do more? Believing in, in something better actually makes people more likely to demand that. So here's an example from almost 10 years ago, actually, of Transparency International Russia, um, of basically it's sort of tongue in cheek, but here's the kind of policeman we want to see, is sort of the kind policeman. And they brought it to life by having a campaign to make Russian policemen wear badges, identification. And so what you're starting to see here is a little bit more police as they should be, the kind of the police who stop and give you directions, the police who help you out. Um, and it's a hard route to go at a time when they are, you know, committing human rights violations. But on the other hand, as long as it's us versus them, they're never going to change. How do we put forward a vision that they have to then start living up to themselves? Um, I'll skip one or two things um, for time. Yeah, so I'm going to, on the LGBT um, example, I'm going to send around a playlist of videos afterwards. And I really I want everyone to watch the video from Ireland, which is called Bring Your Family. But for time, I'll skip that now. But the LGBT movement, is a very good example. They shifted away from talking about ending discrimination of LGBT people, but giving people who weren't themselves gay a way into the, to feel part of the campaign by making it about togetherness, inclusion, love, fairness, um, taking care of each other. Uh, so in Ireland, both in terms of abortion and um, equal marriage referenda, it became very much there were there were grandfathers for yes, men for yes. So. They built their campaign on values rather than being against discrimination. And they built this powerful symbol of pride, which um, in Western Europe now in particular, almost every brand during pride season takes these colors and puts their own brand in it. And there's a question here for our wider cause, for the other values, welcoming refugees, human rights. How do we, right now, those are causes that are seen as very heavy and political, and people don't want to get involved with them. So how do we take those causes and make them something that everyone wants to embrace? Um, I'm skipping a few things here just for time, so forgive me for that. One quick point on this is also identifying the issues that best reinforce our values with people. So in 2014, for the European elections before last, this is a map of what the major issues were in Europe. It's not really a surprise that it was the economy. That has changed uh, to last year, where almost everywhere the major issue is immigration and terrorism. And we, being reactive in civil society, tend to prioritize those issues that are put on the agenda by our opponents. So in Latin America, for example, it's abortion. The problem is these are important issues where we have to work to help the people who are involved. But the problem is when those are the issues that are top of mind, it drives people to support the far right and populists people whose solutions are division, let's defend ourselves, let's put security first. Healthcare and the economy haven't gone away as things that need to be dealt with. So the issues that are top of, top of the agenda have influence on that worldview, that wider way of thinking, how people feel. And so we also have to start looking long-term. And there's an exercise I do. So I invite you to think of, in, in my longer workshops, I ask people to imagine the policy issue you're working on now, what does it look like if you've won in six months' time? But also, if you've won that, what would you start working on next? What's the issue that you would actually really like to make progress on? And then we hear people talking about full gender equality or a world where women can walk home at night without um, feeling unsafe. And what we need to do is start thinking long term. What is our 2030 vision? And what are the ideas and attitudes that we need to start reinforcing today to make those shifts? Because it could be that the way we win on an issue like abortion is actually by changing underlying attitudes to women. 
which might be better changed by a campaign and equal pay. Uh, so that is just a theory, but it's an example of how we might need to start thinking about how we may change in different ways. And one of those is by making the case for our solutions. So the focus on policies. So how do we put forward policies and start setting the debate, setting an agenda? So for example, talking about universal basic income, thinking to that map again, if the debate is around healthcare, as the Democrats successfully made it during the last elections in the US, the key issue underlying healthcare is who's gonna take responsibility to care for each other. And that's going back to that worldview of about our responsibility to care, rather than something like immigration security, which brings to mind this idea of how do we protect ourselves and those closest to us? How do we retreat into the smallest possible group? So here are the challenge is, how do we make people believe that our solutions are possible and desirable? So climate change, for example, there's a lot of desire to try and make people see just how dire the crisis is, how urgent it is that we act. But that again is triggering this despondency, this thing, well, we're doomed anyway, so how, do I, how am I gonna take on these massive challenges? Whereas cognitively, what we're trying, we really need to do is make people believe that a more sustainable lifestyle is possible. So if you look at Greta Thunberg, for example, by getting on that boat and sailing to America, she's shown people, actually, maybe you don't need to fly anywhere. And you can see by how viciously the far, the right-wing th thinkers and commentators are going after her that she's touching a nerve because she's making real that alternative possibility of how things can be. Um, the climate debate also speaks to um, this, in, this issue of how people feel in general about this, the direction of the world. So actually, if we think we live in a world of crisis and scarcity, then your instinct is going to be, right, we're really running out of things, let's get as much oil as we can, or let's take care of ourselves, let's again, you know, our, we can't do anything until China does something. Whereas a framing, a sense of abundance. We live in this planet that is so rich and diverse, in, uh, so rich in natural resources. If only we could find a way to better manage it. So basically, if people see the world as a, a world of crisis and scarcity of limited resources, we're actually pushing them into a mindset where they are less willing to take the policy and lifestyle behavioral changes we need than if we actually frame it as we have this plentiful planet, we may, you can still have negative messages, we're in danger of wasting it, but you make people believe that these changes are possible. Um, so Amnesty International France, uh, for example, did audience research that found the key thing that gets people involved in a human rights organization is they want to be part of something successful. And other research I've done, again, showed people's key question was, how does change happen? So again, thinking back to those ideas, how, how do actually the civil society work? And Amnesty France ran a campaign um, called um, a, a Thirst for Victory, uh, which again, you can see in my playlist. But so there's a question here for, for all of you to consider and discuss at the end and also afterwards. If you're giving someone human rights uh, in a box as rather than our right to water, our right to education, as in something that's given to you by government that can be taken away, but more human rights as a tool that you can use to improve your societies, or human rights as a way for us to treat each other fairly, or, or also just civil society itself. What is civil society? What is the metaphorical tool that you would be giving in this box? Is human rights a torch that you shine on abuses, or is human rights uh, a map that takes us in the right direction? Or is human rights just a shield or civil society? Is it a shield that protects us from harm? Uh, in a lot of the workshops I've been doing, what comes out is actually, we need to shift from this language of fighting to the language of building and growing. And what often comes is a watering can or a garden. And that so civil society, human rights is actually about tending, uh, growing, nurturing a fairer, kinder society. And what's interesting is if that's what we believe, why isn't that rep reflected in the language we use, in the messages and the stories we tell? So let me show you for an example of something that's not very hope-based. This is sort of sums up, I think, um, the way we communicate about the very the tragic and dangerous situation of so many human rights defenders coming under attack. So this video, thinking again of framing, uh, so this video is called Enemies of the State. 
imagine if you, in the top left corner there, if you remove the question mark, that's basically the message of our opponent. So let's have a quick look at this short video. So it's a, it's a very nice video, really nice music and some wonderful images, but essentially we, we um, repeat constantly the message of our opponent, criminals, terrorists, the words are constantly there. Even, even the word human rights defenders uh, comes up as quite um, defensive. Let me show you a video of a different way of presenting civil society, which comes from a Polish campaign called It Works. Wydaje mi się, że drugiej takiej maszyny w Polsce nie ma. Był taki okres, kiedy swoich rowerów miałem już naprawdę kilka, a ciągle chciałem coś nowego robić z rowerami. Do mojego warsztatu, którym się razem trafił Staszek, zainteresowany specyficznym, indywidualnym rowerem. Stwierdziliśmy, że skonstruujemy rower, który będzie dostosowany do potrzeb osób z ograniczeniami. Osób, które już niestety nie mogły się z nami spotykać na ścieżkach rowerowych, nie mogły się spotykać na naszych wydarzeniach. W naszych działaniach lubimy łączyć, dlatego dwuosobowe siedzisko, żeby wspólnie usiąść i wspólnie delektować się widokami z tej rikszy. Riksza powstała po to, żeby pokazać, jak zmieniło się miasto osobom, które już nie mogą wychodzić do parków na tereny rekreacyjne, które są oddalone od ich miejsc zamieszkania. I'll stop that there, but you get the general idea. Those are basically two very different ways of seeing civil society. Um, and so a challenge for us, you know, in our media landscape, obviously we know that media tend to pursue the crisis story, but there is also hunger for positive stories. Uh, and media are being pushed by what works on social media. And the quirky, surprising stories are not only is there space to get those out there, but we need to think what is actually the image, the story that the stories that push the, our way of seeing the world. Um, and one of those stories is about confrontation and another is about society helping the community. So uh, as usual, I'm running way over time, so I'm going to skip quite a few things here. But I wanted to show you some A-B testing that uh, I did in my last job at Amnesty International. So I wanted to find out what makes people join a human rights organization. And so we ran different ads to sort of look-alike audience, people who are similar in profile to those people who already follow Amnesty. And one set of ads was about our research. So human rights organizations expose abuses. That was the top right. In the bottom right, you see human rights as activists challenging governments. In the top left, you see an ad that actually didn't say directly the message was basically about being part of a global community. And there were also ads that made that explicit. And so actually above all, what people wanted uh, most, what was most successful was that image of that idea of being part of a global community, of being part of something bigger than you. Um, there's another series of ads I've just, going to go through this very quickly, but different ways of talking about human rights. So instead of human rights as a deal we made with governments, let's talk about human rights as rules for how we treat each other, uh, or human rights is actually what binds us together in our shared humanity. And that, that's work that's going forward, basically what trying to find a new way of talking about human rights. Um, so for example, this is something that came out of one of my workshops, is you know, human rights is something that nurtures. Um, I'm going to, these are other examples of testing, which I'm just going to skip over for time. Um, well, because I wanted to just bring, briefly touch upon the, this idea of community. So the last two shifts, the second last shift is instead of showing people that there's a risk or a danger if they don't act, to give pe people the chance to be part of something bigger than themselves. So Save the Children, for example, would run this campaign where here's a child who's living an ordinary life in the UK and then she becomes a refugee. And I think this is implicit in a lot of our messaging is that imagine if these bad things happened to you. So again, thinking back to the brain at the beginning, triggering that threat in people. Um, and then what the other side do very successfully with these very simple objects, making people feel part of a community. 
And there's a lot of research that shows that actually being part of community creates the values rather than joining a community because it matches your values. So lots of people who support the pro-life movement are really passionate about it because there was a barbecue in their community or something and made them join it and then they felt a part of it. People are more likely to defend something that they feel attached to. So this is an example of how we have successfully done that, which is the movement in Argentina um, for um, decriminalizing abortion. But there's a challenge here of how do we make people want to belong to our organizations? How do we make people feel passionate about our causes? And I invite you to think later and reflect on in which of these characters best reflects your organization uh, and which one would you most like to go and go for a drink with? Um, so, what, you know, so a key thing just sort of thinking of, of audiences is we can start to reach our audiences, not just on the basis of our politics and how they feel about our issue, but if we start understanding our audiences based on their wider lives. So this is a reality TV show in the United States, but research has shown that you are more likely to be a Donald Trump voter if you watched this show than if you had voted for George Bush um, Jr. in 2000. So you'd think having voted for George Bush Jr. would be a good way of identifying a potential Trump voter. Actually, there was a greater co correlation with this. So we can use this TV show. We can use Facebook and other tools to build audience personas based on culture. Uh, but actually, then I, so the key thing here is identifying new ways, new levels on which to build connections with our audiences to make them passionate about the things we want to support. And then the final shift is how do we shift from talking about victims to heroes? So we overload our audiences with all these different images of these inspiring people but often it's very hard to take a story from this. These are all incredible women human rights defenders, but how do we actually make our audience see themselves in these people? Can we make our audience stand with someone instead of trying to imagine if these bad things happened to you? Um, so for example, one video you'll see in the playlist I'll share later is a refugee, but you make the connection with him because he tells you about the lengths he's going with through to protect his, his dog. This is a campaign that was very successful for Amnesty, where we showed refugees having these very close encounters with um, Europeans. So I'm sorry that I've skipped over so much, um, but I think what I would close on saying is the key thing I'm trying to talk about with these shifts is trying to bring to life ideas that right now seem bold, unthinkable, radical ideas. Uh, and you know, a lot of the, the, the sort of challenges we see in talking about what we for is to make people care, to get attention for it. And I feel what the missing ingredient here is that imagination, which is what that Nike ad was all about. How do we put different ideas? How do we challenge people to think differently? And making that shift, these five shifts I said, from the things we're against to the things that we're for, forces us actually to then, how do we start talking about that world we want to see and the behavior we want to see in daily life. Um, what I'm going to do is take a quick pause for questions, and then maybe I'll show one more video as a nice way to end up right at the end. Um, but so thanks for bearing with me, everyone. Um, and I'll take a pause for questions. Um, and if you have questions, you can um, put them into the chat window. So if anyone, um, what, what, you know, I welcome any questions either on, you know, your sort of reflections on, on some of these ideas, any campaigns you can think of yourself. One, one theory I have is that I, I, one of the reasons I've gone independent is I want to spend more time researching this as well as actually helping organizations apply these shifts so that we can start building campaigns that promote the things we want in the world. Um, is that I, I feel that every major pr progressive victory has actually been built on a hopeful message rather than a negative one. 
Um, for example, I feel that there's a lot of one of the biggest issues we face is, is sort of the rise, the going viral again of racism. But I'm feeling that we can't win by being anti-racist, particularly because of the, the sort of attitudes being displayed by the people who are increasingly voicing racist ideas. What we need to do is be for tolerance. How do we promote tolerance um, as a camp, you know, as a campaign? And then also, you know, that would mean we don't focus on one particular kind of racism. But what does it mean to be tolerant in general? Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to just pick which video I show. Um, well, I'm going to give you, while giving you a chance to come up with some questions, maybe I'll, I'll share my screen again. Um, and I'll show you. Um, so we ended with, we started with a very old political campaign video from Chile. And what I'd like to do is show you the sort of what does that look like now in modern form? So what does a politician look like who's willing to show vulnerability, who's not afraid to talk about what they stand for and put forward concrete solutions and not afraid to be criticized? Women like me aren't supposed to run for office. I wasn't born to a wealthy or powerful family. Mother from Puerto Rico, dad from the South Bronx. I was born in a place where your zip code determines your destiny. My name is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm an educator, an organizer, a working class New Yorker. I've worked with expectant mothers, I've waited tables and led classrooms. And going into politics wasn't in the plan. But after 20 years of the same representation, we have to ask, who has New York been changing for? Every day gets harder for working families like mine to get by. The rent gets higher, health care covers less, and our income stays the same. It's clear that these changes haven't been for us, and we deserve a champion. It's time to fight for a New York that working families can afford. That's why I'm running for Congress. This race is about people versus money. We've got people, they've got money. It's time we acknowledge that not all Democrats are the same. That a Democrat who takes corporate money, profits off foreclosure, doesn't live here, doesn't send his kids to our schools, doesn't drink our water or breathe our air, cannot possibly represent us. What the Bronx and Queens needs is Medicare for all, tuition-free public college, a federal jobs guarantee and criminal justice reform. We can do it now. It doesn't take a hundred years to do this. It takes political courage. A New York for the many is possible. It's time for one of us. Vote for Alexandria. Um, so what, I think the, the most important thing to take anything away from uh, this hour is this is about identifying the stories we need to tell to change minds. And the key thing is those stories are happening already now and we don't need like polished videos like Nike and celebrities. We just need to point the camera and, and elevate the voices of those spokespeople like that um, in a strategic way so that actually brings to life that world we wanna see. So thanks Louise has put in a question, what attitude should we have when we um, so yeah, so what happens when the opposition twist our concepts uh, to make them negative? So for, obviously, Louise, I think you're talking about, for example, like in Latin America, people talk about gender ideology as being anti-family, for example. Um, often our response to this is like we feel, okay, we have to do myth busting, right? Because people are taking our concepts and twisting them. We need to say, no, that's not what this is about, what it actually is about. So the first thing is to resist that temptation. Uh, and I think what we need to do is these concepts, human rights, gender equality, activism, what is the picture we want our audience to have in their mind when they think of those terms? What are those actual, so to me, I don't think we need to abandon words, but we need, so human rights, for example, um, my main mission is to make people care basically about human rights again at that deep emotional level, the way that pro-life campaigners do about abortion. Um, Right now, the words don't trigger the reaction we want. Um, but I believe we can 
through concerted effort, through, through storytelling, change what people think of when they think of human rights. But it, it's about the stories we tell. So the idea, for example, would be around gender equality. What would be the, the words, the stories, the images that would be associated with those words when we use them? And again, right now, for example, you can do social listening, say around the words, civil society, right now, we're probably, you know, in our community, the only ones who use those words. But when we use them, we're constantly using them with an emotion of despair. The dominant emotion in all conversation on social media around civil society is one of despair, because we're saying crackdown on civil society, human rights defenders under threat. Obviously, we need to tell those stories. But if they're the only stories we tell, that's the only idea audiences who will have. And clearly, for example, you saw the Global Witness video versus the Polish video. Most of the big organizations, when they talk about human rights defenders, are talking about the threat, the killings, the violence. Essentially, we're showing a picture to our audiences of a professionalized civil society rather than a community-based civil society. So to me, the first step is we have to identify Essentially, this is what hope-based communications, both as an idea and me as a consultancy, is that to help organizations actually come together and have a shared idea of what is that picture, that idea that they want to become salient in the minds of public opinion, and then develop a storytelling strategy that, okay, for example, we need more stories of NGOs doing little things that help people in the community. It may not be that strategy, but that's an example. Then we, that's, how we, that's our narrative change campaign. Uh, I hope that was helpful.